There you go. Okay, it started. I'm Pat Miller, co-leader with my husband, Steve, of the New Jersey 50 by 30 Building Electrification. This month marks the third anniversary of our monthly BE webinars, three years. Tonight, we have a very special program to launch a new service we're offering, the Volunteer New Jersey Electrification Coach Network. We are a group of, as of now, 13 volunteer coaches trained by Rewiring America, who hope to take New Jersey one step further on the path to building electrification by offering free individual advice one-on-one -on -one to people interested in electrifying their homes with heat pump, heating, and cooling, or other appliances. Building electrification may also include solar panels, battery storage, or EV charging. Um, if you would put yourselves on mute and enter your questions in the chat, we'll try to provide answers at the end. Um, only during the case study, if you have a quick question that can be answered quickly um, by the case study uh, people, then uh, you could raise your hand and ask the question. But otherwise, we'd like to wait till the end to do the questions. Three years ago, we began to focus our clean energy efforts on buildings when we realized that this was the one area of the New Jersey Ener Energy Master Plan that was lagging behind others in both legislation and regulation. Most of you have seen a chart like this one that shows the major sources of greenhouse gas emissions in New Jersey. This report is the latest we have from the 2024 New Jersey Greenhouse Gas Inventory. But as you can see in the small print, the data are actually from 2021. This probably means that transportation may have been very depressed at that point, since that was during the pandemic. At any rate, buildings, residential, and business have not changed substantially and do make up one quarter of all emissions, which is why it is so important to us to reduce building emissions. Building electrification contribute even more to reducing emissions by the addition of rooftop solar or EV charging capability. Tonight, we hope to show you how consumers, as well as the state as a whole, can benefit from having a source of individual advice for assessing the need and possible solutions for switching to electric appliances for their home or small business. Our case study will be of a client, Karen, a homeowner who has taken some electrification steps already and wants the advice of a coach on next step next steps steve will be the primary coach who has gathered from karen data on her home's current situation including appliances and electrical system and will give her advice for going forward other coaches will chime in to clarify details or add suggestions but first some of the coaches will describe the coaching process. Um, our first speaker, or next speaker, is Betsy Longendorf. Um, Betsy, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm Betsy Longendorfer. Um, um, I publish a Substack uh, newsletter called climatefriendlylifestyle.substack.com, and I see my collaborator, Judy Green, here in the audience as well. Um, we, I, 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 I first attended these seminars and saw how uh, important they were. And uh, so I decided to become an electrification coach myself. But um, if we go to the next slide, um, what we really wanted to show you is before we dive into the specific case of coaching someone, we wanted to talk a little bit about in general, how you would coach someone what and what the tools are that are available to you, even without a coach. Um, and encourage you to take a look at them. So I'm going to go very quickly through them because you'll be able to play with them yourselves on your on your own computer. Um, and uh, I, st I stole a line from Jim Price who said, without a good plan, you can't expect good results. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so Rewiring America's personal electrification planner is really thorough, uh, has, a, has a lot of information. And the other benefit of it is that it makes you organize your thoughts and um, put everything down on paper so that you can record all of the 
information that you need to know, most of these things your coach is going to need to know also. So uh, there you go. Next slide. Um, this is the beginning of the process. Um, uh, go ahead, one more slide. The first thing it asks you about is, are you a homeowner or a renter? Because it'll give you different information depending on, depending on that. Um, it asks you where you live because it needs to know who your, uh, who your, utility, your utility is. Uh, because the rebates may differ between different uh, utilities. And then it asks you to go look at your home and tell it all about what kind of heating fuel you, you use um, and all of your other appliances that could potentially be uh, converted. Next slide, please. So um, it also has you enter data about yourself, about yourself, and you may be surprised uh, to that it asks you for your household income, but that's because um, to, if you are a low to moderate income uh, household, um, and I can show you that that definition a little bit later, um, and depending on your household size, you will get you qualify for different rebates. Um, it also asks you what your motivation here. Uh, are you trying to become healthier or uh, have a healthier home? Are you trying to just modernize your equipment or, uh, or whatever? And, and therefore it will prioritize some of the projects that you want to do. Your coach will also ask you this. Okay, go ahead, next slide. So when I push the button to find out uh, from that information what it was suggesting, it says there's two two things I should do before I start work: get a home energy audit so I know you know where uh, what what the heating load of my house is, um, and if I can do something simple to to reduce my costs. And also it it is looking at pre-wiring my home. Um, it's looking at all the different projects and said, hey, some one or more of these projects might require um, you to know, upgrade your electrical panel. Perhaps you should look at all of them that require an electrical update and, uh, and do them all at once one time. Next slide. And so it looked at all the things I said I wanted to do and it gave me a summary of all the possible things. Uh, it, it shows you what your, what your bill impact is going to be in savings per year. Um, but there may, and it keeps track of the ones you've already done. So you can see I've already installed solar panels. Um, you can then press the view project button and find out a lot of details about individual projects. So I arbitrarily chose upgrade to heat pump and weatherize. Uh, next slide. And here we have a ton of information. Um, you can see where the there's a set of buttons. Uh, that's the one that's, um, highlighted is introduction and it goes across costs and benefits, rebates, project, um, contractors, etc. We're going to walk through each of those. What, what you see on the left hand slide, left hand side is the introduction. What you see on the right hand side is um, more uh, the, the costs and the benefits. What's going to help you with your energy uh, bills? What's your climate impact going to be? Um, how hard is this? How long is this equipment expected to last? Um, and uh, what's, what's the health impact? Next slide. And then by continuing to progress along those buttons, we're, we're up at rebates and credits. And you can see that there are four different types of rebates and credits, federal, state, local, and utility. I only have listed here some of the possible federal uh, credits, um, and we'll go through this a little bit more, but I just wanted to show you the breadth uh, of the types of credits that you might be looking at. Um, it also, on the right-hand side, talks about approximate costs for typical projects um, about, about the size of your own home. Okay, next slide. And then you have a specific project guide for, your, for the one you've chosen. So there's a number of steps here. Um, each one of them has a lot of information. Um, I, I specifically chose vet your contractor candidate um, to look at in the next slide. 
again, I'm just trying to show you the depth and breadth of information that they have here, um, which will enable you to look through what you want to do. So there's a number of questions here that you might want to ask your contractor. Um, and I just clicked on one of them, which was how will you size the heat pump? Um, and that's the answer on the right-hand side. And it, it talks about the kinds of things that the contractor should say to you and uh, maybe follow-up questions that you might wanna ask. So you'll probably see some of this happen during the coaching se session that follows. Okay, next slide. Uh, and then there's a the, the one we all have trouble with. And one of the reasons that we're here is uh, finding an HVAC contractor. Um, there are contractor networks uh, already existing um, for th that are specialists in um, in um, home HVAC, and there are also specialists in heat pumps. So uh, one of the what Rewiring America is suggesting here is three known networks: one which is the Building Performance Institute certified contractors, or two two networks from uh, heat pump manufacturers. Okay, next slide. Okay, next slide. So that that was a quick overview. You and um, you'll see you'll see the coaching follow some of that uh, some of that outline. And of course, we all want to know well what will it, what will all of this cost us and what will it save? Uh, next slide. Uh, Re Rewiring America has a uh, has a summary slide from their IRA calculator, just to give you an, a, a broad overview of the kinds of things you could do, what effect it has on your emissions, what effect it has on your bills, whether you could do whether if you're a renter, what it's going to cost you, how long it's going to last. So, so this is kind of a nice slide to um, look at to get started. Um, next slide. Now, I just want to say something about the financing because, uh, as we said, there's federal, state, lo possibly local, and utility funding. Um, as we all know from the national political situation, uh, we're not we're not sure what's going to happen <laughs> there. Um, but also, uh, there are changes right now happening in the state of New Jersey and in utility funding um, from the Inflation Reduction Act. The states had to submit to, to the, a plan to the federal government as far as what their rebates were going to be. And these are just now being uh, finalized. They should take effect on January 1st of 2025. So these numbers are a little bit preliminary. Um, the other thing that's happening is that um, New Jersey plans in three year segments called trienniums um, with the utility companies for what their rebates are going to be. And the, the um, triennium is ending at the end of this year and the new one starts with new utility rebates on January 1st also. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, financing that's sort of up in the air. So don't take these numbers as a final, um, as final right yet. We'll just sort of glance through them. Your contractor should be able to help you with, with this. And so can we coaches. Okay, next slide. For federal tax credits, and these are tax credits um, uh, against your income tax, um, there's section 25C, which is um, some energy efficient home improvement project you did, whether it was putting in a heat pump or doing weatherization or something like that. And there's 25D, which is a, uh, when, you're, when your home uses clean energy or you convert it to use clean energy, you can apply for that. That's things like geothermal uh, energy, solar panels, and batteries. Okay, next slide. Uh, the IRA rebates, as I said, are a little bit um, up in the air right now. Um, just for uh, just for information, I put the uh, chart for um, low income and moderate income depending on your household size here. So you have some idea. Low income is below 80% of the um, area median income and moderate income is from 80 to 150% of the area median income. Um, right now, the BPU proposal is that there, the rebates should be only for multifamily buildings or 
low income New Jersey neighborhoods, because these are the ones that are least likely to be able to afford to make these improvements themselves. Okay, next slide. So this is a table uh, again of the proposed utility rebates. Now, now these are from your utilities as opposed to what the state was going to give you in the last slide. And it also summarizes the, the tax credits, the federal tax credits in blue and yellow. Um, so in general, you can see that there's, there's, there are rebates for heat pump related um, devices and for induction stoves as well as there is there is there are rebates for weatherizing your home and increasing its energy efficiency. Okay, next slide. And uh, right now the federal energy rebates are in black there, um, uh, depending on whether you're low income or not, and how much how efficient how much you improve the energy efficiency in your home you can get different rebates. And these are for single types of projects. Okay, ne next slide. And uh, the, these are again the uh, figures that we're waiting for federal approval of for the New Jersey rebates. They're concentrated on the low and moderate incomes. So you can see the pink is the low income and the green is the moderate income. Okay, next slide. And uh, another really, uh, important thing for homeowners that, is that the utilities often have low or zero interest loans that um, are, to, are over terms like seven years where you pay back the loan uh, on your monthly bill. So that's a, that's a pretty good benefit as well. Uh, next slide. I just want to say something about Energy Star. Um, Energy Star is a uh, is a government website and you can use it to search for products that you might install like heat pumps or refrigerators or other types of appliances. Um, and they will tell you whether or not the rebates apply. Okay, next slide, which I think I'm gonna skip. That's just an example. Um, do I keep going here, uh, Pat, on finding an HVAC contractor? I think so. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it's your choice. It's your slide. So. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll keep going. Okay. I think um, you have three more. Okay. Um, so uh, a, a very difficult part of this is finding a good HVAC contractor and evaluating the quote. Um, and this is a lot of what our coaching network is here for because many of us have been through this process and it wasn't easy. Uh, next slide. You know, contractors are also scrambling to adopt some of the newer technology as well. Um, and there are also new rules requiring new types of refrigerants in, in um, heat pumps that take effect uh, next year. So uh, they are also getting um, they're, they're also getting ed uh, educated. Um, and you want to find a contractor that has uh, a lot of experience in this area. S some of them Play, some places to look are uh, the types of networks that uh, Rewiring America was calling out, the BPI certification or certification by the manufacturer of the heat pump that you might be looking to put in. Um, it's also possible that your utility might have recommendations, but you have to be careful in that uh, it's not just a list of every contractor that, that works with a utility, that it's actually qualified by performance or experience in some way. Um, and uh, we were told that PSE&G can actually also use their own employees to do um, some of this work and they're called uh, Whole Home uh, Performance with, or Performance with Energy Star, not HVAC. Uh, and, and we, the, the newly forming New Jersey Electrification Coaching Network are also developing a database uh, as we get feedback from our members and from other people um, about uh, contractors with experience. Other states are doing this as well. Um, okay, next slide. And again, you'll see, um, you'll see in the coaching, the personalized coaching that follows uh, some of this process happening. Um, we're recommending that you get 
a number of proposals, uh, and, and, which includes, they may include different job scopes. So you should ask things like, can this be done without fossil fuel? You know, maybe, maybe I, I just don't want to replace one gas appliance with another um, and talk to your coach about it. Um, for financing, uh, your again, your contractor should know. We as coaches will know. Um, and another uh, a question to ask, and I, I again, I stole this from Jim Price, is if uh, if if the job differs significantly in price, especially if it's cheaper, what is the reason? What what is one contract what is one contractor doing that the other one is not? And of course, there are technical questions too. Do you need to do electrical panel upgrades um, uh, maybe down the line for a different project and you should combine all of, uh, should, should combine and do one electrical panel upgrade for all of the future products? Do you need weatherization measures um, such as insulation or um, ductwork or ch changing your windows and doors? Do you have specific space or ventilation requirements for some of the heat pump type of equipment that you need to that you need to um, put in? And uh, one uh, final slide, and this is where you again you can ask a coach to help you. Um, the, your contractor should do a heating and cooling load calculation. This looks complicated, um, but what it really does it just says for the lowest possible temperature that we're going to see here in New Jersey, will the heat pump that you selected actually be able to do that job or will you need backup heat? Um, and, um, you know, did, did they actually look at your home to see what, uh, how much energy it, it's expected to use at all of these different, at, at all of these different temperatures? So now, now that we know kind of the structure that uh, a project is going to follow and the types of questions that coach is looking for, uh, we can go into how, how a real coaching session is being done. So thank you. Um, our next speaker is Isla Vassallo, and she's going to talk about the uh, intake form that we have for clients who are in search of coaches. Isla? Thank you, Pat. Yep, I'm going to take um, a few, just a few minutes to talk about the our going electric intake form. If you could, next slide, please. So this is pretty simple. The purpose of our going electric intake form is to collect some basic information from you and have you answer a few questions on why you want to electrify so that an electrification coach can be assigned to help you on your electrification journey. Next slide. So to sign up, all you need to do is enter your name city, county, state, and email. The email is required so that we can contact you. And your location will help us assign a, an electrification coach, hopefully, that is in your area. Next slide. After you've entered your contact information, there are just a few simple questions to help us understand why. Um, you want to electrify, and it's it's okay if you don't have a e detailed explanation. Um, any associated time frame or costs you have in mind, and if you are familiar with the Rewiring America's Personal Electrification Planner that Betsy um, spoke to previously. Next slide. And it's that easy. Once you have submitted your intake form, an electrification coach will be in touch with you. We want to note that um, your information will not be shared or distributed be beyond our coaching group. And you can see on this slide, there is a link to the intake form and um, a QR code. Thanks for listening. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Steve Miller, who will be going um, um, speaking with Karen Schroeder about um, her case study. Thank you, Ella. Next slide, please. 
So welcome to our case study discussion. I'm Steve Miller. I'm an electrification coach. And we tonight we are announcing that our coaches are now available to New Jersey residents. Tonight is a case study on electrifying Karen's house. It's located less than one mile from the Atlantic Ocean in Neptune City, New Jersey. Karen's in our room and I invite her to comment as she wishes. Hello, Karen. Sorry, unmuted. I'm good. Thank you. Good. So I'm going to be asking you a series of things tonight. So I'm glad you're going to be uh, available. We have a number of coaches online tonight and uh, probably a half dozen or more. I'm not sure the count. And I encourage other coaches to also contribute when they wish. Um, I like the attractive brick and block work on both front and back of Karen's house. And this is it. Uh, this photo shows a very large solar array. So that's one of the first projects probably she did. And uh, she has that array on three of the roofs, front and back of this roof and also on this uh, sunroom area. During hot weather, I especially like the overhang that protector here on that sunroom so that the roof overhang is designed so it blocks the summer rays in the summer and it's the right angle so it allows the summer winter rays to come through and I'm assuming right now you probably have full sunlight. That's true. My plants need to be moved back. Yep. So tell us about the heating and cooling situation with your sunroom. So the sunroom was enclosed before I bought it, and it has one small vent, floor vent, for the heat and the air conditioning. And I don't, it really doesn't get that warm or that cool. Um, so I do have to use a space heater at times. So you do have an issue with this. Well, I have two recommendations. Uh, one is to engage a $99 energy audit and ask them to evaluate any needed weatherization or insulation needed for that sunroom. And the second is that when you decide to replace your gas furnace with a heat pump, then you request the contractor insulate and modify basement and sunroom ducting and register, uh, registers more than one probably. So you don't have uncomfortable temperature swings in that sunroom. Next slide. This is Karen's backyard and I find it quite attractive as just like the front. Karen, how much work is involved in caring for your lawn and landscaping? Well, I have a native garden in the back so I don't have any lawn back there. And I have a push mower for the little strip of lawn in the front. So it's minimal work in terms of lawn. That's nice to have, or nice not to have the lawn is what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, now let's look at Karen's current electrification plan. Uh, next slide. The first item on the left top is to arrange an energy audit. So as little as $49, a special price offered by CIEL, C -I -E -L. it's in partnership with green teams in some cities. Um, Regretfully, Neptune City does not have that offer, but a typical price from SEAL and maybe others, probably others, is $99 or a little more. And we recommend the energy audit, and especially to include a blower door test. Uh, the audit, audit will provide a list of areas to be addressed and prices to tackle them. Lowest income homeowners are highly subsidized. For instance, in JCPNL territory, if you follow up in the last reference on page two at the end of my slides, uh, you, you might be pleased with you, what you find. That's to be discussed later. And the second item on the left is to pre-wire your house. Well, that is easy to do with new or rehab construction, but homeowners can save a lot of money by first creating an electrification plan and then having all of their planned electrification needs handled in one visit by an electrician. So tonight we're looking at most of the projects that are required to fully electrify Karen's house. Uh, Karen, I'd like you to tell us what you have already accomplished and also what about areas where you need advice. So when I moved into my house a little bit over a year ago, I knew that I wanted to utilize um, the monies that I had from a previous sale to upgrade the house electrically. So. The first, I wasn't planning to do the solar panels, but I needed a new roof. 
So I figured I was going to do both at the same time. So I did have the sol solar panels installed. When I updated my kitchen, I did uh, choose to put the electric stove in. It's a induction stove. Um, and that's been a wonderful addition. And with the um, rebates and with the tax credits uh, for EVs, I found that I was able to buy a new car, which I needed, and get an EV, a Chevy Bolt. Um, and I've been um, very happy with that plan as well. So let's take a tour of the appliances inside Karen's house. And I'm expanding appliance to be more than what you think. Next slide. We start with Karen's electrical panel. <clears throat> it has a rated capacity of 100 amps of current. And the way you know that is to look at the top breaker on this and you'll see um, 100 stamped on that big top breaker. Karen received a $3,000 quote to upgrade the federal tax credit Excuse me. Federal tax credit Karen would receive with six hundred dollars, as you were shown in the previous slides. We will try not to create conditions that overload overload this panel. Experience has shown that careful planning of electrical appliance upgrades allow use of this these very common hundred amp panels to electrify a three thousand square foot house, and that's three times the size of her house. And a, a licensed electrician can calculate how electrically full uh, this 100 amp panel actually is. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we also have a way to calculate the electrical load. If you look at my references at the end of this, uh, there is an, a, a, a planner a, um, spreadsheet actually that will allow you to calculate using natural electric code requirements what the load is on the panel. Now we need to make the right choices in planning future electrical additions. So we stay within the 100 amp limit of this panel. The problem is not that the panel is full of breakers, uh, is full of breakers right now, because you can buy inexpensive duplex breakers, replace these big breakers in two for in the place of one. They're usually cheap and available. Uh, so the problem is that the calculated electrical load must remain less than 100 amps using these rules by NEC. And, and they're sort of arcane and difficult to understand. So you need help with that. Licensed electrician should be able to do, but I think some don't, many don't know how to do it. Now, next slide, please. So we're taking a quick look outside at the air conditioner. Next slide. And we're looking at the nameplate on this air conditioner. Uh, two, two items of importance. The date of manufacture is May 2019, so it's only five years old, well within this 15 year or so lifetime. Uh, but I found disconcerting was the minimum and maximum circuit breaker size. This, this recommends minimum 20 amp, 240 volts, and maximum 25 amp, uh, 240 volt breakers. But I found neither in the photo of the electrical panel and so probably need to take covers off equipment to solve this mystery. Regardless, if we place replace this current high performance, uh, this, this air conditioner with a high performance heat pump, uh, typically they're higher efficiency than this current AC, then there's a good chance the heat pump will use less power and we're directly substituted for this AC using the same AC uh, power circuit, same breaker, in fact. Next slide. Now, let's check out the air conditioner, air exchanger in the attic. Uh, we pulled down the trapdoor steps here, and we're going to climb upward in a second. I have a ladder just like this, and I also have the same aluminized cover. The cover insulates and blocks airflow, and around the edge of the cover is a zipper to allow attic access. And everybody who has on this call who has a trapdoor like this should really think about insulating as, we, as you show here. Another evidence of air sealing would be if you, when you open the cover, if you find foam sealant around the frame and the outside, that means it's likely weatherized. Now, if you look at my personal trap door in my house, you'll find foam sealing. I did it myself. I'll talk about that in a second. Next slide. So we're now in the attic and we see the AC unit on the left here and all the octopus cold air tubes to cool the first floor. 
The AC is totally separate from the basement furnace, which we'll visit in a couple of minutes. One contractor recommended removing this AC and its ducts and replacing everything with a new heat pump in the basement. One issue in the attic, I think, uh, I've, I see no ventilation of the attic. Uh, Karen says she sometimes opens the window. There's one at each end of the attic to cool the attic. A concern is condensation of moisture that could produce mold. Attics need airflow to keep dry. On the other hand, the roof itself is shaded by the solar panels, which would seem to completely cover just about each side of this roof. I recommend that again that Karen use the JCPNL and audit and weatherization program to provide the, the proper way to, to ventilate this attic flow, airflow. Next slide. And here's the best way to check depth of insulation. Simply stick in a ruler in multiple locations, and we measure nine inches of insulation. Uh, actually, that's a little insufficient. 14 inches or more is usually recommended. So it's possible that some added insulation would be recommended, but not necessarily required by an energy audit. Next slide. So now we've moved down into the basement from the attic. Karen calls this her monster basement furnace. She has to stop underneath and, and soup to walk underneath the ducts. And right in the cent center of this photo, you'll see a 120 volt AC outlet mounted on the large central duct and next, it's next to the gas water heater on the left. And this outlet could be very conveniently be used later for a shared circuit 120 volt heat pump water heater and not disturb our balance on the, uh, the power panel. Karen, tell us about your bedroom temperatures. The bedroom and the bathroom are directly over this monster furnace. And it, I guess because it has very little um, direction or very little space to go, it overheats the bedroom and the bathroom. So it's very warm in there when the heat starts up. It does balance off after a while, but the rest of the rooms are a little bit cooler. Um, not uncomfortable, but they are cooler. So if we have an energy audit, it may recommend duct insulation. I'm sure it will, in fact. But the ducts here are so conveniently accessed that the cost of labor should be pretty low. Uh, I'll show you the ultimate low. Uh, next slide. There, here's my do-it-yourself project duct sealing kit. And you can buy all this stuff cheap at Lowe's and Home Depot. This is how I ba insulated my basement uninsulated ducts. These, these uh, number one, I used a, a stiff brush to apply that duct sealant, the water-based thing in the barrel, a little one gallon barrel on the bottom edge. Um, I apply it to all crimped metal edges, likely to leak air, and I let it dry and then cover the crimped edges with aluminum foil tape. And so this, you can see here as well. On the right is a three or four foot tall roll of reflective aluminum covered bubble wrap which claims a high R value when it could block heat, providing you follow directions on the package insert. They're not very difficult, you just need to follow them. Uh, the bubble wrap comes in various widths, it can be sliced in seconds by utility knife and taped in place around the pipe. Highly refractive surfaces of aluminum result in high insulation R value. This ductive sealing could be done by a weatherization contractor after a recommendation by an energy audit. Next slide. On the right of the monster furnace is the washer and gas dryer. Against it's mounted, or they're located against the basement wall. They're in the, they individually plug into the standard wall IC outlet that is going to be is behind uh, the silver vent dryer pipe. The dryer could eventually be replaced by a condenser type dryer or a heat pump dryer, or the entire washer could be replaced by a combo heat pump washer dryer. Uh, which I'm going to show next. But Karen, first, tell me how you dry your clothes usually now. Uh, downstairs, I've got them up there now. I have a long pole that I dry them in the basement when the weather is bad. Otherwise, I dry them on the line outside, except for towels. Amazing. So, so many things are similar between you and your house and mine. I use an outdoor clothesline. I've been using it for years. But this year, my washer broke. 
and we wanted to eliminate the guest dryer. So we bought a combo washer and dryer from Best Buy. I immediately stopped using the outside line and have absolutely no guilt. We eliminated gas and we're using sun-powered electricity from our community solar supplier at 20% below JCPNL electric prices. Next slide. And this is my household's new combo washer and guest dryer. I see my wife smiling. The combo has one cord requiring relatively little electricity, which plugs into a wall AC shared outlet. And the water drain and hot and cold supplier exactly as the previous washer. And it's ventless. I removed the old dryer vent and patched the outside hole, and I took great pleasure in plugging the gas, eliminating the gas by plugging the, I turned off the valve, but then plugged the old gas line. My local Best Buy showroom floor has the same similar type of combo washer dryer from three different manufacturers. Prices and features are very similar, and these are all Energy Star rated and can qualify for a couple of hundred dollars rebate from JCPLL and the other New Jersey utilities. Next slide. So back to Karen's basement. This is the current A.O. Smith gas water heater. It's located on the left side of the furnace. We recommend replacing gas with the newest heat pump water heater, which is simple to install. The gas can be easily shut off with a red shutoff knob you see on the left on the vertical gas pipe. And then a plug installed and the heater can be easily removed and carted away by the installer. The new heat pump acts like a basement dehumidifier and will be draining water. So you will need an inexpensive condensate pump to collect and pump to the nearest nearby closed washer drain that's about four feet high off the floor. A heat pump furnace to be installed later will also share this condensate pump. Next slide. And this is the label for that current hot water tank. Capacity is 40 gallons and is manufactured in 2018. It's six years old. Uh, tanks after, often leak after 10 years, so it's good you're planning to replace it with a heat pump. And the question of what type of heat pump? Well, next slide. You might replace with a heat pump water heater in late next year. I think it'd be great for you. We recommend a 120 volt shared circuit heat pump water heater that plugs into the nearby 120 volt shared outlet that's used by the furnace fan. The recovery time of a 120 volt heat pump will be much slower than gas. So you need to install a bigger tank like 50 or 60 gallon tank instead of 40 gallons. Uh, but there's another, however, the little boxes on the left side tell you not to install in the US North where average temperatures fall be below 37 degrees in the winter and they, the problem is they would drop the temperature of the incoming water from underneath the ground. Instead, uh, what you should do, wait, wait until next year for the release of new cold climate heat pumps by most manufacturers of water heaters. And this would ensure that if the heat pump is, uh, this will ensure that the heat pump will not be frozen out and not fail because it has a tank of icy cold water. So see the lower light right for a quick delivery and installation by Home Depot. You don't need a specialist. Home Depot is fine. Also, nearby low stores carry A.O. Smith, which is Ream's major competitor. And you can rely on Ream and A.O. Smith and other competitors. They're very keen, watch each other, and they all continue to buy, uh, provide heat pump water heaters with very similar features. Next slide. I, I want to take you to something that's near and dear to Karen's heart. Uh, induction ranges now are the rage nowadays, and Karen went off and did it. Uh, they slide right into the hole in the, uh, kind of the, the cabinets where you pull out the old gas in the, uh, range. Induction range uh, uh, ranges are all sorts of price points, and it's highly advantageous to use these instead of the, uh, because it provides health for air instead of gas uh, by installing electric rather than highly polluting gas. These slip right and they're easy in to, to install, except you need an electrician to install a 240 volt circuit. And that means you need to carefully count electrons used from your panel 
and I'm an electro engineer, so I, <laughs> I use that fallaciously, sort of. Hmm. Uh, install those electrons swarming out of your panels to make sure you're less than the 100 amp capacity of the panel. So next slide. Tell us about this. There's my baby. I love this stove. It is easy to cook with. It's um, easy to clean. I did have uh, some practice ahead of time with one of those portable plates that were induction plates and found it to be not a problem at all. And uh, I can boil water, like you see the kettle there, I can boil water in half the time that it used to take me. It's You just have to get used to keeping an eye on things initially, but then once you get that, it's so easy. Tell me, tell me also, you started to tell us about your new EV car. Yes. Tell, tell me, tell us how you ch did charge and now what you're doing to charge your EV. Well, I, I still will go to a local place, but I found that in the summer, um, it was up at the, at the outlets. I would go up there uh, and no problem. I would you charge it and then come back. It would take about 45 minutes, but that was fine. I would read a book or something. And then it started to be a problem in the summer. Um, more and more EVs were coming out, I guess. People were there charging. So I just got my courage up and I used the charger device that came with the car, plugged it into um, 120 volt in the garage and overnight charged my car. I was very pleased with myself. I'm glad you did that. Uh, uh, you can switch the slides, but I wanted to answer, you mentioned that you were worried a little bit about affecting your electrical panel. Yes. Plugging yeah. it in. Um, my answer is that there's likely no problem. The worst case is you may find yourself occasionally tripping the circuit breaker or the outlet you're using, and you should check around to see what else is dead ensuring that same breaker and then I just keep... found something too but one of the <laughs> lights but it's in the in the kitchen here okay but oh okay I'm I'm used to I know how to fix that I mean I, I'll just go down I haven't done it yet but I'll go down and flip the switch okay in the kitchen's interesting because you don't want to use the same circuit as your refrigerator <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or you can you might trip your refrigerator off and not even know it until the next morning. Yeah, that's, that's good. Nice. That, that so was... if if so, then you, you should search around for different outlets until you find one satisfactory. Yeah. I'm glad you know how to uh, handle the circuit breaker when trips. Yeah. So uh, next slide. So I in the next few years of slow charging that Chevy Bolt, you're going to find that you wanted to go step up, I'm sure. Right I now, do. Using 120 volts, it's slow. Yeah. And yeah. and so the next appliance might be an EV charger using 240 volts. And here's how you can upgrade using your same panel. It has no effect on the panel load. You had a product called Simple Switch. And I've shown how it's wired in. There's you know, I had a, this electrician as a conduit from this thing, six inches in diameter, small, to the to the existing panel and then adds a second conduit off to the new EV charger. And uh, it's it's now using that electric range you have, your induction range, which is the white thing. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, it's using that as the control device. So whenever that's on, the EV charger is off. Whenever the electric range is off, the EV charger is enabled. And so when you program the EV charger um, and your car, they know when they're off and when they're on. And so they'll just resume charging the way it did before if they get interrupted by your electric range. So this will, sure, uh, will share your 40 amp induction stove circuit breaker in that panel. And it works perfect. It should work perfectly. We you know, I had a testimonial a couple of nights ago, but somebody who's installed three or four in some development of his of these devices, and they do work do work quite nicely. And you have not increased the load on your panel. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Now, when the electrician installs that device, you need to also worry about what's at the end of that conduit over to the EV charger. <coughs> 
And what I recommend, I'm going to talk a little bit softer, get closer to the mic. And uh, what I recommend is using this uh, type of, of charger. It has a built-in ground throttle inter interrupter, which you've got to worry about as well. And, and this is manufactured by Tesla, called a universal wall connector. It's just like their standard Tesla charger. It's going to be really reliable. <coughs> and it can be programmed for all these different charge um, amounts, all the way up to 48 amps. But for you, <coughs> if, you if you're um, both handles it, I would use a 32 amp or 24 amp. And and then you that would be perfectly uh, fine with a 40 amp breaker. And the effect would be you could charge overnight in 10 hours, about 200 to 250 miles on your car. Okay. So this table is magical uh, uh, for any car, right? really. The, how, long, how, how long it takes to charge a certain time and, and distance. So this this last chart, <clears throat> I'm going to spend just a, like three or four minutes on it, and it's the topic is how to select a qualified HVAC contractor to replace your gas furnace with a heat pump. Uh, you should use the references attached and use where we're in America, uh, where an electrification plan is described, and you should ask numerous questions of prospective contractors about how they suck the heat pump that best matches your house. They should not guess. They should not go by any rules of thumb. Um, they should use the manual J modeling software to model your heat loss, but that's only the first step. <clears throat> Contractors should have be trained and use new and evolving tools. <clears throat> uh, these tools are on NEEP, N-E-E-P, Northeast Energy Efficiency Alliance. That's an industry site, well known, but maybe not the HVAC contract you're talking to may not be trained on how to do it. If contractor doesn't know what this thing I'm showing you is, and doesn't is not trained on using neat tools, they should you should go to a different contractor. Because this is really critical to size the right heat pump for your house. And I'm I'm going to show you what happened here. So we I plugged in what looked like a very good Mitsubishi cold climate heat pump. And there's, you can see here the model number that I used and Anik does this automatically, by the way. So this is all done automatically. You're gonna know, know how to interpret this. The This heat pump does very, very nicely on cold weather for your house. This, uh, this These would be curves applying to your house as best I can determine from the uh, the gas and electric bill that you've supplied me. I use the month of January, 2024, to calculate what the heat loss was your house. It was the coldest month of the winter. And this is the curve, the flat curve to the left, the flat curve off going up to the right as well. The problem is whether the cold, the, the cold temperature is no problem, it'll keep up pretty well. If you get down to like 10 degrees or five degrees, it's, there's a deficit, which means overnight it might cool, cool your house off a bit, but the next day it'll heat up again. That's, so that sort of behavior, if that's acceptable, you don't need supplementary heat with this, which is great because you don't have electrical power available. But the problem is the cooling characteristics are too great for this heat pump. And it is such a high capacity that most of the time it's off. And it turns on briefly and then turns off and off and on. And the, uh, the cycle time is like 80% of the time it's it's cycling you know, on and off. And this is not the heat pump to use because of the cold weather, because humidity will not be taken out of the air. And I think on the shore, close to the ocean within a mile, I think you need to worry about, probably do, about high humidity at times. You need a device, heat pump, that will take the humidity out. This will not. And so it's very dangerous. 
not to shop around the contractor, not to look at various heat pumps to find the best match for your house. And he might try 10 different, and there's tools on e, any EEP that make it easy to do this. He might find 10 different proposed matches, and then he needs to choose the best one for your house. And it might be different models, different manufacturers. The HVAC contractors tend to uh, focus on one manufacturer because they get trained. So uh, I just told you the secrets of, I think, something that's important. These are the types of questions you ask. Do they use the modeling software? Have they shown that your model, the model of heat pump they have proposed does good for both cold temperatures and hot temperatures? And then show you the data. You don't have to understand this. Good. Just did they do the data <laughs> analysis? Good. Okay. Uh, I told uh, Jim, uh, Jim Price is on the call that I would have some things to say, and I'm not sure what he's going to say. So I, I invite him to pipe up. Well, we, we right now we need to move on to the. Yes, of course. And, okay. And the next speakers, Chris, I, I want to get this done before we have the Q and A and and Chris will do it quickly, I'm sure. Okay. Um, and then we'll have Q&A. Okay. Uh, I wanted to quickly go through this. Uh, very Let's useful not. reference. Let's... Okay, we'll go on to Chris. Well, we're gonna have the references. We'll send them out to everyone. Okay, great. Okay. I pass the baton to Chris. Okay, thank you. That, 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 those were great slides, Steve. Um, so, so the goal, of course, is to electrify everything. Uh, and so that we don't have to burn any kind of fuel any any longer. Um, and of course, that's that could be a slow process. Um, you saw in Karen's case, she has an air conditioner that's 2019. Uh, that has a lot of uh, life in it yet. Uh, her water heater as well, it has a lot of life in it. So, so it's not meant to say that you have to go out and re replace everything. But if you go through that personal electrification plan, it will help you to set priorities on what to change. And then you'll be more aware of the different possibilities. And then when the time comes, when you say, oh, gee, the water heater is uh, starting to leak or the furnace needs another repair, then you're more prepared to know what to look for. And, and, that, and, and by then you'll be able to be able to make smart d decisions. Sometimes these things are just at the, at the, on a knife edge. J just before a lot of these wonderful uh, heat pump dryers came out and combo washer dryers came out, uh, our system broke. And, and so when we would go to the store to ask about the new things that we saw uh, coming, nobody was prepared. So there's always those timing of effects. Um, next slide. So, but, but the first part is to become an electric enthusiast and to really understand why it's important to electrify everything. And, and so there's all different levels of involvement. Just being aware in your own home is a big step forward. There's many people that I meet who have no idea what I'm talking about. They, they say, oh, well, of course my house is electric. And it's like, no, uh, are you electrifying everything that you would otherwise be using that would be burning fuel? Oh no, why would I do that? Electric is expensive. It's like, no, actually you'll save money doing this. How would that happen? Oh, because heat pumps are four times more efficient than an electric coil. And so it comes down equal to, and sometimes less than the cost of using gas and oftentimes very much less than the cost of using oil and definitely less than the cost of using propane. Um, my, my last uh, uh, interaction was with, uh, as a coach was with someone who uses propane and it was a very easy calculation in order to save cost. Um, uh, uh, next slide, uh, Pat. But the other goal is to enlist you as electrification coaches. So here is a graph which basically shows all of the different appliances that, that use electricity that we've been talking about uh, that may be using other fuels such as your gas furnace or your gas boiler, uh, et cetera. And, and we with the lifespan of appliances, such as a new furnace, we have to really try to get these conversions going as quickly as possible in order to make an impact. Uh, there's 140 million homes approximately in the US. And if we want to have uh, really making a, a difference on residential uh, 
uh, carbon emissions, we, we have to get going on this. So we need a lot more electrification coaches and we need uh, more and more trained contractors. Uh, ne next slide, Pat. So anyone can be an electric coach. What you've heard from uh, Betsy and from Steve sounds pretty technical. And at first it, it is a little bit overwhelming when you're going through the training, but you can actually do this at all different levels. Uh, just going through the training and being aware of what they're talking about is a big step forward. At least you can start pointing people in the right direction. And then the coaches don't act independently. As you can see, we're all acting kind of as a team and some have more experience. For example, Steve with, with his electrical engineering and actually Betsy too with her electrical engineering uh, and others have may have other experience. So, so really being electric coach is kind of a team at, at effort. Uh, you're spreading with the word, not just um, through your local uh, family, uh, friends, uh, but you might actually get involved in other areas like presenting uh, to a, a larger groups in your depth, in, in your area that you are familiar. And as you go, you get more and more experience and you can see all the great links that, that have been posted in order to help with your education. So, so the training is really a way to start you off on the journey and then as you go, you get more and more experience. Uh, next slide, Pat. So the training is a four week uh, based training. Uh, there's five coaching specializations, uh, starting with uh, sealing and insulation um, and going through to what is a heat pump um, and, and going through to what are these heat pump water heaters and how do they work? And then how to actually size a heat pump for a home and understanding that graph that, that Steve just just put, put up. And, and, and once you get through with all of those things, there's lots of other side topics that are done as well. This is all done online. And when you get done, you really have a much clearer idea of what's involved. Um, and they, they do these courses over, the, uh, over about a month's time. And then they'll have a series of classes uh, month by month by month. Okay, Pat. So volunteers are needed. Uh, and if anyone would like to, I know we have a number of electrification coaches already in the meeting, uh, but if anyone would like to, to be an electrification coach, we can help you to get uh, in contact with Rewiring America and, and to try to get into the next cohort. And uh, the more people that take the course, not only will you be more trained for yourself, but for uh, the team effort that's going to be required as we move forward. Good, I think that was the last slide. Thank you, right. 